Romeo and Juliet is a play written by William Shakespeare and was premiered at some point between 1595 and 1597. As I'm sure you're aware, Romeo and Juliet is perhaps Shakespeare's most famous works, probably because of how relatable one may find it to their own love affairs, likely those that took place in their teenage years or first loves. The plot itself is thought to originate from two pieces of literature, those being the tragical history of Romeo and Juliet, which was a poem by Arthur Brooke in 1562 and The Palace of Pleasure, a collection of tales dedicated to the Earl of Warwick in 1567 by William Painter. While Shakespeare is thought to have added more depth and character to these stories in his Romeo and Juliet, he was believed to have borrowed heavily from these two sources, before adding his own dramatic and comedic flair and incorporating his own characters like Paris and Mercutio. During the English Restoration, Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet was revised many times by various playwrights, some removing the action of the play and others offering a happier ending. For the purpose of this video, we'll be focusing on Shakespeare's version of Romeo and Juliet, and ignoring the reworkings by George Bender and David Garrick, which are, in my opinion, quite poop. We are first given an introduction by an individual known as the Chorus, who gives us a brief background about the two rival families living in Verona, Italy. These two rival families are the Montagues and the Capulets, two families who bitterly hate each other over an ancient grudge. What the grudge is, no one seems to remember, nor is it ever actually addressed in the play. In the first scene, Samson and Gregory, two servants of the Capulet family, are out for a stroll when they stumble upon Abram, another servant but for the Montague family. After some bickering, they start to fight, and Benvolio, a member of the Montague family, tries to defuse the situation. This sees another Capulet enter the scene in the form of Tybalt who misconstrues Benvolio's good intentions in stopping the fight as an act of violence. This sees the two start going at it, and pretty soon, there is a brawl. With the commotion, Prince Aeschylus arrives on the scene and demands everyone to stop fighting. He tells them he's sick of their stupid fights and tells them he'll arrest the next person who starts this up again. After everyone is dispersed, Benvolio finds his cousin Romeo, who is utterly depressed over who he claims is the love of his life a woman named Rosalind, who does not return his affections. Benvolio leads with the notion that there are plenty more fish in the sea, and seeks to get Romeo out of his slump. Meanwhile, Capulet, the main Capulet that is, speaks with the nobleman Paris, and tells him that he wishes him to marry his daughter Juliet. Paris agrees, and a feast is to be held. A servant named Peter is tasked to invite everyone whose names is on the list of paper, but Peter cannot read. Mistakenly, he ends up in writing Romeo and Benvolio, who he runs into, not realising that they are Montagues. Despite knowing they shouldn't attend, Benvolio convinces Romeo to go, so that they can see women who are much prettier than Rosalind, and to get Romeo into phase 3. That is, to picture himself with these other women, and to get him to stop fantasising over Rosalind. Over in the Capulet household, Lady Capulet tells her daughter Juliet about her suitor Paris, who has been arranged by Lord Capulet himself, or Juliet's father. Juliet agrees to meet Paris, but doesn't think much of the idea. We are also introduced to the most annoying character in the whole play, that being Juliet's loathsome nurse, who spouts some pointless anecdote about her dead husband, even though no one asked her. We then see Romeo's friend Mercutio introduced a man who seems to enjoy ribbing on Romeo because of his crappy love life. Both he, Romeo and Benvolio are seen to be wearing masks so as to hide their identities as they attend the Capulet feast. It is here that Romeo sees Juliet for the first time, and pretty much falls in love with her. Tybalt, Juliet's robust and confrontational cousin, who was seen fighting with Benvolio in the beginning, recognises Romeo and goes to fight him. But Capulet stops him and tells him to chill the F out and to try to not make a scene for once. Romeo and Juliet start flirting with each other, and Romeo gets to first base, twice in fact. He leaves under Benvolio's caution though, and escapes the feast before anything can turn nasty, and before he has the chance to give his name to Juliet. Juliet has her nurse confirm his identity however, and she is both stricken and excited that this man is Romeo, a Montague, and a sworn enemy of her house. 
The chorus returns again and tells us that while Romeo is now over Rosalind, he is even more depressed because now he loves Juliet, a Capulet. He knows this love is just as forbidden as his last, and so runs off into the night. We see Benvolio and Mercutio look for him, before ultimately giving up and going home. Romeo then finds himself upon the house of the Capulets, more specifically the balcony of Juliet. In this famous scene, Romeo sees Juliet enter upon her balcony, and the two profess their love for each other. Romeo decides to marry Juliet. He visits Friar Lawrence the next morning and tells him of his plan to marry Juliet in secret. Friar Lawrence is reluctant, but he also realises that by marrying a Montague and a Capulet, it might bring about peace between the two families. Romeo meets up again with Benvolio and Mercutio, who call him out for ghosting him the previous night. Both Mercutio and Romeo enter a battle of wits against the other, before Juliet's nurse shows up, and gets utterly savaged by Mercutio, who implies that she is an ugly man. Romeo tells the nurse to tell Juliet to come out to the cathedral in the afternoon, where he plans to marry her. The nurse agrees, heads back to Juliet, and takes about five pages of catching her breath before being able to disclose Romeo's plan to her. Juliet is thrilled at the prospect of marriage with her forbidden love, and heads to the cathedral where they are married. Next, Mercutio and Benvolio are wandering about when they are approached by Tybalt and a bunch of Capulets. He demands to know where Romeo is so he can fight him, likely for attending the feast that was meant to be for Capulets, and for causing him to embarrass himself by getting dismissed by Lord Capulet for acting up. Mercutio antagonises the hot-headed Tybalt before Romeo shows up and tries to pacify him in the wake of his secret wedding. When Romeo refuses to fight, Mercutio fights for him. Romeo tries to break up the fight, but Tybalt sneakily strikes under Romeo's arm and fatally wounds Mercutio. Mercutio dies cursing the pair of them. Tybalt flees, but then he comes back. In the rage of having been part of his friend's death and feeling partly responsible, Romeo kills Tybalt. He flees the scene, but Benvolio hangs about to tell the authorities and the prince what has happened here. After hearing his account, the prince banishes Romeo from Verona and declares that if he is found in the city after 24 hours have passed, he will be killed. The nurse tells Julia of what has happened, and Julia is torn between mourning her cousin Tybalt and mourning over the fact that she can't see Romeo anymore, for he has been exiled. She gives a wedding ring to the nurse and asks for her to give it to Romeo, as well as to tell him to come to her so that they can have a final goodbye. Romeo is in despair over what has happened, and is seen to be with Friar Lawrence, who is keeping him in hiding. We see a shoddy attempt at suicide here from Romeo, who pines over Juliet. But Friar Lawrence basically tells him to pull himself together, and tells him to go and spend the night with Juliet, and then to flee to Mantua, where he will be safe. He believes that the prince, in time, will change his mind about Romeo, and allow him to come back. While this is going on, Lord Capula is unaware how badly his daughter is affected by all of this. He seems utterly consumed with the idea of her marrying Paris, in that he begins to plan the wedding himself, and tells Paris to attend in just a few days. Romeo, who spends the night with Juliet, says his goodbyes and flees from her residence, lest he be caught and killed. He leaves just at the right time too, as Juliet's parents enter and tell her about her marriage to Paris. When Juliet resists the idea of getting married, given that she's secretly married to Romeo of course, Lord Capulet goes mad. He calls his daughter worthless, and tells her that she will marry Paris, or he'll kick her out. Turning to her nurse, she asks for her advice, but the nurse echoes Capulet's intentions, telling her that it's probably best if she marries Paris, because there'd be less drama, and it wouldn't be a taboo. Juliet pretends to agree but tells us when she is alone that she will go to Friar Lawrence to seek an alternative solution, or that she will take her own life. In Act 4, we see Juliet go to see Friar Lawrence, only for her to find Paris there, arranging their wedding. Paris declares his affections to Juliet before leaving her alone with the Friar to pray. However, Juliet tells the Friar that she intends to kill herself if she has to marry Paris. Seeking to help Juliet, the friar proposes a plan to reunite her with the exiled Romeo by faking her own death. He gives her a potion that will slow down her heart rate enough that she will appear dead 
and advises her to take it the night before her wedding with Paris, so as to make it look like she passed in her sleep. He theorises that she will be taken to the Capulet family tomb, and laid to rest there, but in 48 hours she will awaken as if from a long slumber. He tells her that he will send word to Romeo of this plan, and that when she awakens, he will send Romeo to collect her and take her to Mantua, where they can be together in peace. Juliet returns to her father and mother and begins the ruse, telling them that she agrees to marry Paris. The wedding day is moved up, and we see Lord Capulet begin fussing over the wedding arrangements, going as far as to stay up all night to ensure the preparations. Juliet goes to bed and ponders on the vial of poison, pondering over what could go wrong. She begins to see the ghost of her cousin Tybalt as he searches for Romeo, and begins to entertain doubtful thoughts. Eventually though, she drinks the poison and enters a deep sleep. The next morning, the nurse goes to awaken Juliet, but finds she cannot. She believes her to be dead and summons the whole household to see for themselves. Everyone is distraught and the wedding is of course called off. Meanwhile, in Mantua, Romeo learns of the news through his servant Balthazar. Romeo is cut up over the news, and proceeds to purchase poison from an apothecary for himself. He intends to travel back to Ravona and drink the poison by Juliet's tomb, so that he may lay beside her when he dies. Interestingly, we also notice that when Romeo asks Balthazar if he has a letter from the friar, Balthazar says he does not. It is this letter that would have explained the true nature of Juliet's death, and would have detailed the friar's plan. Instead, we later learn that Friar Lawrence gave the letter to another friar named John to deliver, but that Friar John ended up getting locked in his home by the authorities, who believed he had the plague, and so quarantined his residence. Because of this, he was unable to send the letter that Romeo desperately needed. Paris comes to Juliet's tomb to pay his respects, but hides in the shadows when he hears Romeo and Balthazar approaching. Romeo dismisses Balthazar and begins to pry open Juliet's tomb with a crowbar. However, Paris misconstrues this as an act of vandalism and disrespect and confronts Romeo. They start to fight and Romeo kills Paris in the skirmish. Paris's page, who was also present but hiding in the shadows, witnesses what has happened and runs to call the authorities. Romeo enters Juliet's tomb, beholds her dead body and then drinks the poison killing himself beside her. Friar Lawrence turns up and finds the dead Paris, before entering the tomb and finding a dead Romeo. Juliet awakens and asks the friar where Romeo is, but the friar hears someone outside and gets spooked. He flees from the scene, leaving Juliet to discover Romeo's dead body. She recognises the poison that is still fresh on his lips, and kisses him, hoping there is enough poison on his mouth to affect her as well. But Paris's page and the watchman entered the tomb, prompting Juliet to stab herself with Romeo's dagger. Balthazar and Friar Lawrence are caught by the authorities and brought to the scene of the crime by the watchman, where they are treated with suspicion. The prince enters the scene with Capulet and Lady Capulet, followed by Montague. Friar Lawrence and Balthazar explain what had taken place here and how the events led to this very moment. Realising that this was all their own doing because of their family rivalry, the Capulets and the Montagues put their differences aside in the wake of their children's death, and end their feud. When we think about Romeo, it's easy to imagine him, based on Shakespeare's characterization, as a very handsome and very intelligent teenager, who is deep and ponderous. Not only is he passionate and well liked, but he's also rich, and comes equipped with the backing of a successful family. He is in touch with his emotions, so much so, that he can verbalise them, sometimes appearing far older than he actually is. We see a demonstration of this very early on in his first interactions, where he talks to his cousin Benvolio, telling him that he understands love well enough that he knows it makes men bend to its will, and that if love is meant to be blind, it is still a most powerful thing. Alas, that love, whose view is muffled still, should without eyes see pathways to his will, he tells us. From the very first encounter, we learn that Romeo doesn't much care for the feud between his family and the family of the Capulets. He barely even notices the aftermath of the brawl that had taken place moments before his arrival, for he's too caught up with his own heartbreak and the rejection by Rosalind. Love becomes the single most important thing to him, 
so much so that it dominates most of his motivations for anything in the play. Like most teenagers who are in love, Romeo is overwhelmed by these new feelings and probably places more weight on them than he ought to, saying things like, this love fill I, that feel no love in this. And this also reveals that he feels alone in his plight, because his feelings are not reciprocated. It is a reflection of real life relationships, where one may go through rejection or even a breakup and become so devastated by the fact that they feel absolutely alone, unable to process thoughts about anything else, or that this pain is being experienced by millions of people around the world as well. Like many young men, Romeo is burned by love and this leads him to resent the notion, saying, love is a smoke raised with a fume of sighs, being purged, a fire sparkling in lovers' eyes, being vexed, a sea of nourished with loving tears. What is it else? A madness most discreet, a choking gall, and a preserving sweet. He expresses this base pessimism, believing that the rejection from Rosalind is truly the end of his world, again something that may feel like the end of the world to a teenager like Romeo, who hasn't experienced such a hardship before. In fact, it may go doubly so for someone like Romeo, who appears to have such a low resilience for matters of the heart, given that he is rich and comes from a noble family. Indeed, Romeo likely has servants for his servants, and so it's likely he has never experienced a hardship before, or having to experience a reality where he can't have something he wants. He's unable to process this heartache because he is not used to disappointment, and it rocks him pretty hard, to the point he even questions his own existence, saying, I have lost myself, I am not here, this is not Romeo, he's some other where. Romeo seems to forget his heartache pretty soon though, particularly after the age-old advice given by Benvolio, who tells him to examine other beauties, or to go out there and smash someone else, you mopey git. Romeo is dragged along to the Capulet party along with Benvolio and Mercutio, aka uh, Lad's Night Out, where he spots Juliet. Immediately, he forgets Rosalind and states of Juliet, it seems she hangs upon the cheek of night like a rich jewel in an Ethiop's ear. Beauty too rich for use, for earth too dear. Show shows a snowy dove trooping with crows as yonder lady over her fellows shows the measure done. Which basically translates to, Fwa, she's fit. He pretty much says that she is so beautiful that she shouldn't even be buried when she dies and that no other woman can even compare to her. Here, Shakespeare shows us the fickleness of young men, or arguably men in general, where we think we found the one, and then fate throws us a curveball, and we end up meeting another woman who tickles our fancy just a little bit more. This is very evident in Romeo, who spends the whole first scene pining over Rosalind, only to pretty much forget she ever existed, after glancing upon Juliet. You might say that there is something far more poetic in this, in that Romeo seeing Juliet for the first time is evidence of true love, and that he forgets about Rosalind because Juliet is simply the one. But if we look at how he explained Rosalind in Act 1, Scene 1, where he says, She hath Diana's wit, and in strong proof of chastity, she lives uncharmed. She will not stay the siege of loving terms, nor bide the encounter of assailing eyes, nor open her lap to saint-seducing gold. Oh, she is rich in beauty, only poor when she dies, with beauty dies her store. It seems to me that Romeo is quick to fall in love with any woman he's attracted to, and again, this is certainly a reflection of young men who are inexperienced to such intense feelings, and are probably horny as hell. Friar Lawrence sums this up perfectly in Act 2, Scene 3, where Romeo asks him to marry himself and Juliet, he states, What a change is here! Is Rosalind, whom thou didst love so dear, so soon forsaken? Young men's love then lies not truly in their hearts, but in their eyes. While we may question Romeo's feelings given that we see him drop Rosalind like a bad habit in favour of Juliet, we can't deny how far Romeo actually goes for her. He not only goes against his own family, who would surely disown him for his courtship of the enemy, but also goes as far as to marry her. He's so keen to be with her, that he's even willing to surrender his own name when she asks him, Art thou not Romeo and a Montague? To which he replies, Neither, fair maid, if either thee dislike. The fact that he's willing to give up his own family's name puts him in a submissive position, something which may have been seen as a woman's duty at the time. 
given that women were expected to give up their names and take the names of their husband. We should also remember that Romeo doesn't actually ever try to get Julia into bed, and the one time they do spend the night together, it's never explicitly stated that they consummated their marriage. Whilst they declare a lot of love to one another, lust seldom seems to be a focal point between the two. Through this, Romeo's intentions are certainly innocent, and to his credit, he doesn't look at any other woman after this either. He doesn't come across as a creepy, pervy, horny teenager, but instead more like a man who is content to be in Juliet's company, so long as the two are devoted to each other. Romeo likely believes that this is love in its truest form, and this may stem from the fact that unlike Rosalind, Juliet is reciprocative of his affections. Perhaps the only woman to be reciprocative of his affections. Whilst Juliet has her suitors, one being in the form of Paris, Romeo doesn't appear to have the same luck with women. He is so depressed by the fact that he is out of love, that perhaps he may see Juliet as his one and only chance to achieve that which he craves. Because of this, Romeo enters a scarcity mindset, and would explain why he is so intensely in love with Juliet, because if he doesn't make it work with her, he won't have anyone at all. Once Romeo has confirmation of his marriage, we see him become a completely different character. No longer is he miserable and downcast, but now bantering with Mercutio and getting the better of him too. They rib on each other in Act 2 Scene 4, and seem to have a good laugh in this battle of wits. This is a massive contrast to how he was seen in the beginning, lamenting over how futile love is and how his life is virtually forfeit. It's quite clever of Shakespeare to have this scene in here, for at first it seems like a pointless interaction between Romeo and Mercutio, but it's actually reflective of how we might feel when we're in love. One may feel on top of the world, and that no situation can get them down. One may speak with far more confidence, may be more engaging with others, and generally shown to be a better person. In a way, love is like a drug that makes us happy, which is exactly what Romeo is in that moment, jesting with his friends and showing a high-spirited side to him that we unfortunately don't get to see again. We also see another side to Romeo which gives us a glimpse of the complex man he may have become. This of course is anger. Whilst Romeo often resigns to moping about in the first scene, to wailing and crying before the friar when he is banished, there is one scene where we see him lash out with the utmost rage. When Tybalt kills Mercutio, Romeo undoubtedly blames himself. After all, he had tried to show Tybalt love, given that he was now married to Juliet, and wished to extend a hand of peace in respect to his wife and her family. Tybalt, being the ultimate douchebag of the play, ignores Romeo's attempts to defuse the confrontation, and actually uses Romeo's good intentions to fatally wound Mercutio by stabbing underneath him. It is one of the most powerful moments in the play when Mercutio asks Romeo as he lays dying, why the devil came you between us? I was hurt under your arm. To which Romeo innocently replies, I thought all for the best. Tybalt took advantage of Romeo's good intentions and cost him the life of his friend. Despite his marriage to Juliet, Romeo proves he is as much a Montague as the rest of them, but despite the love he feels for Juliet, he cannot allow for Tybalt to get away with this. He realises that he should never have tried to get Tybalt on side, and that his love for Juliet has taken away his better senses. He states, O oh, sweet Juliet, thy beauty hath made me effeminate, and in my temper soften valour's steel. Essentially, Romeo realises that it's bros before hoes, and not wives before lives. He tells Tybalt, Mercutio's soul is but a little way above our heads, staying for thine to keep him company. Either thou or I, or both, must go with him. Rage literally guides his course in the next few moments, as he kills Tybalt, and for this split moment, we see Romeo put the interest and honour of his friend before his love for Juliet. Sadly, Romeo quickly descends back into his one-track mind, and shows no regard for anything other than Juliet. He cares not for the pain he has caused in killing Tybalt, nor seems to reflect on his friend Mercutio, nor the fact that his family will not see him again. He only cares that he has been banished, and that in being banished, he cannot see Juliet. To be honest, the fact that he killed a man in cold blood, and only gets exiled, is a pretty sweet deal, and yet, Romeo acts as if he is facing the death penalty. Yet again, we come to realise that Romeo is indeed nothing more but a teenage boy, and while he does have some mature traits and some profound things to say, 
his emotional resilience leaves much to be desired. He refers to this banishment as torture and hell, laments over Juliet, and even berates the friar for trying to help with philosophy, because according to Romeo, philosophy cannot create another Juliet, and is therefore worthless. Friar Lawrence rightly tells him, oh, so madmen like yourself are also deaf, showing us that Romeo is beyond consolable and beyond any reason. We literally see this idiot throw himself on the ground and start having a tantrum, a perfect example of how much of a child Romeo is and how unequipped he is to deal with anything that tests his character. It's because of this that I find it hard to connect with Romeo, and I'm sure many would agree. Romeo is a good looking, educated, wealthy man who Shakespeare ultimately wants us to feel sorry for by the end of the play. To be honest, I've never felt much for Romeo. I think he robs Hamlet of the crown of being the biggest twat in the universe, and I for one cheered when he drank the poison. He literally has every advantage a young man could ask for, and so I can't feel bad for him at all. Ah oh, boo hoo, you can't get a girlfriend. Imagine if Romeo was disfigured, disabled, scarred, or suffered some sort of ailment that made him more inept. Imagine how much harder he would have found it. Then I would have felt bad for him. I would have probably even rooted for him, and the tragedy would feel all the more cruel and intense when he drank the poison. But no, again, Romeo is a privileged arsehole who enjoys the benefits of his rich family, and so the fact that he experiences a bit of heartache doesn't compel me in the slightest. When Romeo learns of Juliet's apparent death, he wants to die as well. His mental health comes into question here, as he declares, Well, Juliet, I will lie with thee tonight, meaning he wishes to die beside her, something he immediately becomes certain of as he purchases the poison. We only need to see how rude he is to his servant Balthazar to determine how skewered his thought process has become. Without Juliet, he decides his life has no purpose, and resolves to ending his life so that he does not need to experience a moment without her. Why he can't just hang himself in silence, I don't know. This is a melodramatic teenager we're dealing with, one who probably wants the attention too. If you ask me, I've often wondered that if Romeo was so cut up about Juliet, then why doesn't he just drink the poison when he's in Mantua? Why travel back to Verona, go through all the effort of opening up Juliet's tomb just to drink it by her corpse? There's literally no benefit in doing this, and yet he becomes fixated on dying by her side. It's almost like he himself has read too many romance novels, and believes that in doing this, he will somehow be honouring her, or perhaps even joining her. I just wish Balthazar had the balls to tell him that in dying beside her, dearest Romeo, you won't achieve much. Wanna know why? Because you'd be dead, you moron. We finally see the extent of Romeo's character devolve into madness as he opens up Juliet's tomb. He tells Balthazar who accompanies him to the graveyard that Whatever thou hearest, or seest, stand all aloof, and do not interrupt me in my course. Why descended into this bed of death is partly to behold my lady's face, but chiefly to take thence from her dead finger a precious ring, a ring I must use in dear employment. Therefore hence be gone, but if thou, jealous, dost return to pry in what I father shall intend to do, by heaven I will tear thee joint by joint, and strow this hungry churchyard with thy limbs." He's pretty much telling Balthazar here that if he comes back to see what he's doing, he will kill him. He also seems to become fixated on retrieving the ring from Juliet's finger, but we never really learn for what purpose he intends to use this for. Some have speculated that he intends to use the ring as a form of token to enter heaven, and as proof that he is married to Juliet and allowing them to spend eternity together. But for the most part, his reasoning is ambiguous, perhaps again a sign of his utter madness. Some have thought that he intends to take the ring back so as to disguise the fact that she was ever married, but it's thought that the Capulets who had buried Juliet would have seen the ring and surely come to that conclusion by now anyway. Romeo's grief for the death of his beloved only shows him descend further into hysterics as he begins to have a go at the tomb itself, saying, Thou detestable moor, thou womb of death, gorged with the dearest morsel of the earth, thus I enforce thy rotten jaws to open, and despite I'll cram thee with more food. In this he makes the tomb sound like a beast, one that he has to come to offer himself to because he no longer wishes to live. He even acknowledges his own madness when Paris confronts him here in the graveyard by saying, Stay not, be gone, live and hereafter 
say a madman's mercy bid thee run away. Much like Hamlet, perhaps we might say Romeo is stepping in and out of madness. For while he is able to recognise his own erratic behaviour, he also spares some moments of regret after Paris is slain. He tells him, O oh, give me thy hand, one with me in sour misfortune's book, I'll bury thee in a triumphant grave. This erraticness is only furthermore consolidated as Romeo confesses he is happy he is about to die, simply because he lays eyes upon Juliet and knows he is about to join her. The finality of death does not scare him, possibly because in death he can escape the pain of not possessing her love in the way he once did. In his final monologue, Romeo appears to be almost at peace as he acknowledges Tybalt's grave and tells him that he will avenge his death by killing his murderer, of course, which is himself. He becomes content with his decision as he beholds Juliet, telling her, Why art thou so fair? Should I believe that unsubstantial death is amorous, and that the lean abhorred monster keeps thee here in the dark to be his paramour? For fear of that, I will stay with thee, and never from this palace of dim night depart again. He is essentially telling her that he believes that the tomb, which he already believes to be a monster or some beast that represents death, is also in love with Juliet. He believes that she is so beautiful that death itself has fallen for her, and so he cannot leave her because he does not want death to have her when she belongs to him. In this line, his decision becomes absolute. He knows he is going to do it, and there is nothing now that can stop him. There is no hesitation as he declares, Come bitter conduct, come unsavoury guide. Though desperate pilot, now at once run on the dashing rocks, thy seasick weary bark. And it's here we can see the turmoil he is in, that he sees no other way out of the situation but to end it all. Here's to my love, he dedicates his suicide to Juliet, and thus with a kiss, he dies. Whilst Romeo is a 16 year old, still a mere boy if you ask me, Juliet is but 13 years old, hardly the sort of age to go about thinking about love and marriage. Yet as much as we have spoken about boys getting carried away with love, girls are guilty of this too, perhaps even more so. Some might say that Juliet's character is decided for her by her father from the very get-go. Whilst he deliberates with Paris as to whether she should be even getting married at such a young age, he gives Paris his blessing to try and charm her. Already Juliet is established not as a woman or even a girl, but as something for Paris to possess. Such is usually the case with Shakespeare's women. Juliet is established as a sheltered character, one who is ruled by her father and the other men in her life. Interestingly, Capulet's hold over his daughter extends to his wife, Lady Capulet, and she interacts with Juliet as if by proxy speaking often or not with his voice, despite being a woman herself. We see this in where Lady Capulet gives Juliet the illusion of choice in Act 1 Scene 3, asking her, How stands your disposition to be married? To which Juliet replies, It is an honour that I dream not of. Despite giving her answer honestly, Lady Capulet bulldozes her opinion and tells her, Well think of marriage now. Younger than you here in Verona, ladies of esteem are already mothers. Despite Juliet's response of not wanting to be married, she is ignored and her opinion disregarded, as Lady Capulet proceeds to push the idea of Paris onto her. One cannot help but feel bad for Juliet. Her age most certainly marks her as a child, and yet she is being pressured with the concept of marriage and even childbirth. Juliet is unable to stick to her guns as she shoots down the idea of marriage, for she later responds as dutifully as any child from such an era that she will try and see if she can love Paris. She even says that she won't fall for him any more than her parents will allow, showing us how much control Juliet allows them to have, that they can even decide her own feelings for her. From this very first scene with Juliet, we understand a lot about her already, that she is ruled by her parents, that she is a product of some questionable upbringing, and that she unfortunately is quite robotic as a result of it. It is no wonder we see her rebel in the way that she does. It's noted that many girls Juliet's age are often married, some of them even with child. Through this, you might say that Julia is used to seeing her peers swapping the ownership of their fathers for the ownership of their husbands. Most of these marriages are likely arranged, as is her marriage to Paris, 
and so Juliet may very well have been looking to rebel from the very get-go. Romeo's emergence facilitates this fantasy for her. Not only does he approach her without the endorsement of her parents, he does so by himself, without any reinforcement from any notable higher up. You see, no one speaks for Romeo. Everything he says to Juliet is genuine, and everything he says comes from his own heart. Romeo is more than just a pretty face to Juliet. By this argument, he is a wild card. He's outside of the norm. In Romeo, Juliet beholds something brand new, something that the other suitors of her house cannot offer her. The fact that Romeo, to his credit, is a bit of a smooth talker doesn't hurt matters either, and it is the fact that Romeo is so bold that draws her to him in the first place. Romeo doesn't need anyone's permission to kiss her, he simply shoots his shot. Paris, on the other hand, dicks around with protocol and family etiquette. But Romeo shows a more rebellious side by bypassing all of this and going for what he wants. This resonates with Juliet, and we can tell this by how well she receives his kiss, telling him, you kiss by the book, or you kiss like you've studied it. This rebellious streak is only furthermore awakened within Juliet when she learns who Romeo is, a Montague, and this fuels her desire for him because he represents the enemy, something exciting and taboo. It is a thrill for Juliet, a thrill that someone as monotonous and predictable as Paris cannot offer her. We can certainly see that Juliet has far more chemistry with Romeo than with Paris. Just look at their heartfelt and totally not cringy exchange in Act 2 Scene 2, which is dedicated to them. But whilst the so-called bad boy streak that Romeo demonstrates by kissing her so boldly might have inspired her attraction, it quickly becomes more to her than just that. She is smart enough to recognise that Romeo is a Montague, and that their love would indeed be forbidden, but she is willing to cast away family names if it means they can be together. We see this when she calls from her balcony, O Romeo, Romeo, wherefore art thou, Romeo? Deny thy father and refuse thy name. Or if thou wilt not, be but sworn my love, and I'll no longer be a Capulet. We see here that whilst the forbidden aspect might appeal to one such as Juliet, she is pragmatic enough to understand that so long as they are Capulet and Montague, nothing good can come from their relationship. It shows that she is not so foolhardy as to rush into this without considering the complications it will produce, and shows that despite feeling so intensely in the moment, Juliet can separate the emotion from the logic something Romeo is far less adept in doing. Another reason why Juliet is so caught up in love for Romeo is because like Romeo, she has never been swept off her feet. This feeling of attraction is new to her, and she can't help but find herself carried off by it, particularly how Romeo sneaks his way beneath her balcony and declares his love for her. We never see Paris do anything of the sort, and so it's no wonder Juliet falls for Romeo in the way that she does, because he gives her something she has never had before. In an annoyingly beautiful way, they give each other the pieces in which they have been missing in their own respective lives. Whilst Juliet never seems to wrong Romeo in any perceivable way, Romeo certainly wrongs Juliet. Upon learning of Tybalt's death, Juliet is stricken by her love for Romeo and her newfound anger towards him for killing her cousin. O oh, serpent heart hid with a flowering face, she says, did ever dragon keep so fair a cave? Beautiful tyrant, fiend angelical, dove-feathered raven, wolvish raving lamb, despised substance of divinus that showed just opposite to what thou justly seemest, a damned saint, an honourable villain. She is mortified over what he has done and could very well be the first time we see her question the nature of Romeo and whether he is really that good for her. Interestingly, Romeo does the same thing after Mercutio is slain, where he questions his own masculinity, noting that the reason why he didn't help Mercutio fight Tybalt was because of Juliet, she who for that moment had made him soft. Here, both characters momentarily have doubt about whether they are good for each other, and interestingly, the common denominator is Tybalt. Tybalt represents a wedge between the two lovers. He is the obstacle that the two are posed with, perhaps the first hurdle of their relationship. However, it is a hurdle which both appear to sally over, for Romeo continues to pine for Juliet, and Juliet immediately regrets taking Romeo's name in vain, saying, Oh what a beast was I to chide him. 
Whilst Juliet is often perceived as naive in that she so readily falls for Romeo and that as a teenage girl the other characters pertain to know more than her, Juliet does demonstrate some shrewd perceptions, some might even say a sixth sense. She not only sees Tybalt's ghost looking for Romeo, but she also envisions Friar Lawrence's plan for faking her own death as going terribly wrong. Not only this, but her observation of Romeo looking pale as he sneaks away from her room is another astute remark. Oh God, I have an ill-divining soul. Methinks I see thee now. Thou art so low as one dead in the bottom of a tomb. Either my eyesight fails, or thou lookest pale. And this is remarkably interesting, because it shows us how dead Romeo feels the further he gets away from Juliet. It also foreshadows his eventual fate. The clincher though, is despite their proclamations of reuniting, this is the last time Juliet sees Romeo alive. We begin to really get on side with Julia in the subsequent conversation she has with her parents about marrying Paris. Both Capula and Lady Capula are utterly insulting towards their daughter, by not only forcing her into a marriage, but also declare her unworthy of Paris, and even wish death upon her. Capula tells her, Unworthy as she is, that we have wrought so worthy a gentleman to be her bride. Basically saying that Paris is far above her, and that she should be grateful he even wants someone as lowly as her. Lady Capulet tells her, I would the fool were married to her grave, telling us she'd rather her daughter be dead than show this level of defiance in refusing to marry Paris. Having seen such disdainfulness from her parents, we begin to hope that Juliet does reunite with Romeo, not necessarily because we want them to reconcile, but because we want Juliet to spite her parents and beat them at their own game. After being called worthless, ungrateful, and even a curse at one point, Juliet begins to realise that she will not win this argument with outright defiance. She asks the nurse for help, but the nurse encourages her to swallow her own feelings for Romeo, pretend that the marriage didn't happen, and to marry Paris, so that it appeases her father. She tells her that Paris is far better than Romeo anyway, and proceeds to disregard Juliet's feelings, seeing the marriage from a more pragmatic point of view, something a love-struck Juliet cannot do. It of course causes her to resent the nurse just as much as she does her parents, and while the nurse may have meant well with her suggestion, it irks Juliet. She feels betrayed by someone who should have known her better. She says to herself, Go, counsellor, thou and my bosom henceforth shall be twain, showing that she dismisses her closest companion, and that from now on she will keep her secrets to herself, for the nurse cannot be trusted. Because of the nurse's betrayal in siding with Juliet's parents, Juliet feels entirely alone. Romeo becomes her only avenue for even the slightest of companionship, and Romeo becomes the only one she can trust. In this, it is no wonder she goes to such lengths to be with him thereafter. When Juliet visits the friar, we see a new side to her, a steely conviction and a sign of her strength. Where Romeo continues to pine and cry on the floor in the face of adversity, Juliet seems to ride the wave and seeks to find a solution for her misery. To the friar she says, If the wisdom thou canst give me no help, do thou but call my resolution wise, and with this knife I'll help it presently. And what she means by this is that if the friar in all his wisdom cannot help her, then she will kill herself there and then. She even produces the knife to show she means business, something we know is not a bluff, given that she does indeed stab herself at the end of the play. The fact that she is so adamant and so compelled to act this way shows us that despite being a teenager, she is very capable of deciding her own fate. This is unlike many of the women in Shakespeare's works, where the fates of women are usually restricted or dictated by the males around them. From Gertrude to Desdemona to even Cordelia, women in Shakespeare's worlds are usually obedient to their male peers. But Juliet rejects this notion and clearly would rather choose death. Perhaps the most compelling thing about Juliet's death is that she stabs herself, something that would require far more nerve than, say, drinking poison. Whilst Romeo drifted peacefully to sleep with the happy thought of being with Juliet for eternity, Juliet has a most violent death in comparison, bleeding out as she is forced to realise Romeo's suicide. Due to his quick wit, his energetic charisma, and the way he provides comic relief, Mercutio appears to be many people's favourites. When Mercutio first appears in Act 1, Scene 4, he's immediately likeable, 
from the way he tries to boost Romeo's spirits in getting him to dance, as well as the outlook he has to life. He tells Romeo, If love be rough with you, be rough with love. Trick love for pricking, and you beat love down. And what he's telling Romeo here is that he is giving up too easily, and that sometimes one may need to get tough with love in order to get things to go their way. He comes across as benevolent in the way he supports Romeo, but thankfully he doesn't enable Romeo either. He recognises that Romeo is going through a hard time, but doesn't start feeding him falsehoods in order to get him to feel better, but tries to reshape his outlook by being as sarcastic and mocking as possible. He knows Romeo will cheer up if he lets loose a little, and even tells him that Tut duns the mouse, the constable's own word, if thou art done, we'll draw thee from the mire. And what he means here is that Romeo is behaving too cautiously, and being too sensitive to his own feelings. He ought to be enjoying himself more, instead of getting hung up, and even tells him that if he gets stuck in the mire, that he and Benvolio will pull him out. In essence, Mercutio breathes new life into the play, in that his character is bubbly, fun, and pretty much living his best life, which is more than I can say for some of the other characters who seem to be stuck in this very mire that Mercutio mentions. The banter between Romeo and Mercutio is also an enjoyable interaction to witness, given that they are both educated and both give as good as they get. In fact, one might argue that Mercutio verbally jabs with Romeo in order to get him to stop being such a stuck in the mud and to try to get a rise out of him so as to stop him thinking about Rosalind. He even ends up going off on a rant about the Queen Marb, a fairy queen in English folklore known for bringing sleeping men their deepest wishes in the form of dreams. The fact that Mercutio goes off on this tirade at all makes him even more likeable, in that he is quite kooky and different. Again, he is truly unique when compared to the rest of the characters in the play, who are quite stiff and often so serious and glum. Mercutio is like the candle in the dark in this play, one that flickers and draws our attention immediately, rendering him as one of the most memorable characters across all of Shakespeare's works. Whilst he's fond of making jokes and teasing people, Mercutio is also very intelligent and logical. It is this very logical side to him that allows him to see through all the nonsense of love and monogamy that is so heavily imbued throughout the entire story. Mercutio is pretty much the personification of the left side of the brain, in that he is methodical and doesn't get swept up by all the romance going on around him. Instead, Mercutio sees the world for what it is, and you might say is quite realistic as to how things work. Just look at what he thinks of Romeo's dreams in general in Act 1 Scene 4, where he says, True, I talk of dreams, which are the children of an idle brain, begot of nothing but vain fantasy which is as thin of substance as the air, and more inconstant than the wind, who woos even now the frozen bosom of the north, and being angered puffs away from thence, turning his face to the dew-dropping south. Here he tells Romeo that dreams are pointless, and dreams are nothing but random images thrown up by the brain, an idle brain no less. He implies here that anyone who thinks dreams are significant are childlike, that dreams literally are vain fantasies, and that dreams have the same substance as air. In a way, he kind of reminds me of Rick from Rick and Morty, in that someone may have a fanciful, creative, scientifically liberal idea or notion that brings them joy, and Rick will come and shit all over it with logic. Mercutio is doing exactly that here, where Romeo tells him that he had the dream they shouldn't go to the Capula Ball. Not only does Mercutio play along for a bit that he had the dream too, but also trolls him with the whole Queen Marb story, before telling him that dreams are stupid, and that he shouldn't let them be an influence in his decisions. We see him carry on this sardonic behaviour when Romeo goes running off to Juliet's balcony. Benvolio seems to be more worried about where Romeo went than Mercutio is, and calls out to him, but Mercutio goes a step further by calling out to Romeo in mocking. He says, Nay, I'll conjure too, Romeo, Humours, madman, passion, lover, appear thou in the likeness of a sigh. Speak but one rhyme, and I am satisfied. Cry but I me. Pronounce but love and dove. Speak to my gossip Renus one fair word, one nickname for her purblind son and heir, young Abraham Cupid, he that shot so true. When King Copetua loved the beggar maid, he heareth not, he stirreth not, he moveth not. The ape is dead 
and I must conjure him. I conjure thee by Rosalind's bright eyes, by her high forehead and her scarlet lip, by her fine foot, straight leg, and quivering thigh, and the domestness that there adjacent lie, that in thy likeness thou appear to us. Pretty much all of this is him taking the piss. It's quite amusing to imagine Benvolio genuinely calling out to Romeo, and then Mercutio trying to help by calling out as well, but with all these savage burns. He calls him a madman and a lover, does impressions of him saying, I, me, and implies that the only words he knows are love and dove, words that might seem quite feminine. He even begins to try to summon Romeo by mentioning Rosaline and describing her body, for he believes that Romeo, even if he was dead, would not miss the sight of such a thing, furthermore implying that he is weak to women and powerless against Rosalind in particular. When Romeo falls in love with Julia and they profess their feelings to each other, Romeo is in far better spirits. He is able to go toe to toe against Mercutio in a battle of wits in Act 2 Scene 4, to which Mercutio is grateful for, telling him, why, is not this better now than groaning for love? Now art thou sociable, now art thou Romeo. Once Mercutio learns that Romeo isn't acting irrationally anymore, he starts to take him more seriously, and doesn't proceed to rib on Romeo for the remainder of the play. It's almost as if he is relieved to have his friend back, and can now relax in his company instead of feeling the need to tease him into seeing things more rationally. Instead, Mercutio turns his attention to a far easier target, the nurse. She enters the scene with Peter, to which Mercutio tells him, good Peter, to hide her face, for her fan's the fairer face, basically saying that her fan is far prettier than her face, and she'd do well to hide behind it. The fact that the nurse becomes Mercutio's target is pretty hilarious, given what an annoyance she is, but it does also make Mercutio look quite insecure. Notice how he only picks on Romeo when Romeo is at his lowest point, and while he may be doing this to get Romeo to think better, it may be that he also does it because he knows Romeo won't fight back. The nurse is obviously in no way prepared for such an attack, and even if she was, would probably not be able to return such fire. In this, Mercutio knows she is an easy kill, one who won't show much resistance, and so doesn't hold back from insulting her. You might say he is kind of an arsehole, but I still love him. We see this same need to call out people for their shortcomings continue in Act 3, Scene 1, where Mercutio turns his attention to Benvolio, telling him, Thou art like one of those fellows that, when he enters the confines of a tavern, claps his sword upon the table and says, God send me no need of thee, and by the operation of the second cup, draws it on the drawer, when indeed there is no need. Here he tells Benvolio that he is short-tempered, and that he is like a person who prays never to have to use his sword, only to pull it out eagerly against the nearest possible person, even if they are innocent. He continues that Benvolio could be in the greatest mood, and he'd still end up finding something to get angry about, even though we never actually see Benvolio demonstrate such behaviour. In fact, Benvolio often seems to be quite calm, and perhaps here we see Mercutio projecting his own issues onto someone else. After all, is Mercutio not the one to usually strike first? Is it not Mercutio who baits Tybo into a fight? You might say that Mercutio is somewhat delusional, in that he is quick to pull up people for their flaws, flaws that he himself may very well be guilty of. The fact that he so frequently seeks to point out people's weaknesses perhaps shows more about him than it does the other characters, and that he feels better about other people's follies and feels empowered that he has the high ground over them. Basically, Mercutio is a total narcissist, but at least he's funny about it. He tells Benvolio, Nay, and there were two such, we should have none shortly, for one would kill the other basically telling him that if there were two Benvolios, one of them would kill the other. Perhaps Shakespeare is trying to show us the irony of Mercutio's character. He only just gets finished berating Benvolio for being too hot-headed when they stumble upon Tybalt, who Mercutio seems to try to get insulted by, if only to start a fight. Tybalt merely asks him if he's a consort of Romeo, to which Mercutio gets offended, saying, Consort, what dost thou make us, minstrels? and thou make minstrels of us, look to hear nothing but discords, here's my fiddlestick, here's that shall make you dance, Zounds, consort. Here he draws his sword and can't seem to stand the fact that Tybor has made an assumption that he hangs out with Romeo. 
There's literally nothing offensive about what Taibo has asked, and yet Mercutio is now holding his sword out and ready for a fight. Which makes me wonder if Mercutio was just looking for any old excuse to go about beating someone up. In Mercutio's final scene, he says perhaps one of my favourite lines across the entire play. A plague on both your houses. After Tybalt stabs Mercutio, Mercutio says this line three times to Romeo, letting him know that in his death, he curses both the Capulet house and the Montague house. This likely stems from the fact that Romeo came between him and Tybalt in their fight, and that Mercutio blames Romeo for his death, saying, I was hurt under your arm. We can really feel the venom of Mercutio's words here. He feels betrayed by Romeo, and in typical Mercutio fashion, doesn't opt to take any of the blame himself. He doesn't recognise that it was he who taunted Tybalt into the fight, and doesn't recognise that none of this would have happened had he just kept his own head down and left Tybalt alone. Like how he points out the flaws of Benvolio, he does the same to Romeo, condemning him, by asking, why the devil came you between us? In true narcissist fashion, Mercutio wants everyone to know the gravity of his peril, and spouts his final words in the very anger he had just berated Benvolio for, saying, Help me into some house, Benvolio, or I shall faint. A plague on both your houses. They have made worms meat of me. I have it, and soundly too, your houses. Unlike the other characters who die, Mercutio does not submit to some divine force, or find peace in death but instead goes out restless that he has been killed by someone like Tybalt. He does not accept death nobly, but instead proceeds to blame everyone else around him for his fate. Friar Lawrence is perhaps one of the strangest blokes in the play. I mean, is this guy even a priest, or is he some sort of political puppeteer, pulling the strings of everyone around him whilst masquerading as a benign and caring old man? Whilst it cannot be denied that he means well and wishes ultimately for peace, he goes about it in some pretty shady ways, none the least failing the death of a 13-year-old girl with poison. We see him plot to marry Romeo and Juliet behind the backs of everyone, and whilst he is granting them their wish to be married, Friar Lawrence has his own motivations in unifying the two, and that is to usher in an age of peace between the Montagues and the Capulets. So yeah, whilst he's a bit of a schemer, I guess at least he's scheming with a healthy outcome in mind. What's most interesting about the Friar is his mystical knowledge of plants, noting his first appearance in Act 2, Scene 3, where he ponders over his plants, admiring the way in which one can bring relaxation, but too much of it can bring death. It's certainly incongruous with the behaviour of a Catholic cleric, one who might have been warded off studying what the church would have considered pagan witchcraft. Seriously, women were burned at the stake for studying stuff like this. It's also interesting that despite being a holy man, the friar praises Mother Nature for the abundance of plants, and not God himself. It does make me wonder whether the friar is actually religious at all, going by the way he carries on. In any case, the friar is one of the most profound characters based on his insights alone. He chastises Romeo, who comes to him to proclaim his love of Juliet, reminding him of the state he was in when he was in love with Rosalind. Thou and these words were all for Rosalind, and art thou changed? Pronounce this sentence then. Women may fall when there's no strength in men. Here the friar gives a socially charged statement, and gets us to think about the state of society, and the way women may have been looked upon at the time. He tells Romeo here that if he can swap and choose between women so readily, then women ought to be able to do the same with men. Here the friar encourages caution with Romeo, almost implying that his love for Juliet is just like that for Rosalind, and therefore fickle and not something to be so heavily invested in. Romeo believes he is being sensible, because he has listened to the friar's words, and buried his love, like he was told to in regards to Rosalind. Despite having buried his love, the friar tells him, not in a grave, to lay one in, another out to have. And he is basically reprimanding Romeo, by telling him that all he's done is replaced his form of flame with the flame of another, and that this is no solution. It kind of reminds me of how we might plug ourselves with a relationship when we ourselves are lacking in something important. Many people dive headfirst into relationships so as to avoid feeling lonely, but this is not dealing with the problem, as the friar suggests here. All Romeo has done is replaced one wound for another. He has not solved the problem at its root, which of course lies within him. It's a shame Romeo doesn't heed more of the friar's advice, 
as he does prove to be quite wise with his proclamations. He tells Romeo and Juliet on their wedding day that these violent delights have violent ends, and in their triumph die, like fire and powder, which as they kiss, consume. The sweetest honey is loathsome in its own deliciousness, and in the taste confounds the appetite. Therefore, love moderately. Long love doth so too swift arrives, as tardy as too slow. And what he means here is that sometimes, the more intense a thing is, the more prone it is to breaking. And so we must be cautious in these things, that we value dearly, because when they go wrong, they really, really do go wrong. You might think of this in terms of relationships again, where people put all their hopes and dreams in a person, and then that person goes and stabs them in the back. It's this sort of thing that Friar Lawrence seeks to warn against, going on to compare the sweetness of love to being like honey, but that if honey is too sweet, then it too will taste sickly. Having too much love, therefore, can be a bad thing, and therefore it is imperative to be moderate when experiencing such things. It's interesting that Friar Lawrence does indeed suffer similar irony to Mercutio, in that despite his warnings about being cautious, it is his planning that gets everyone killed. Remember, Romeo did not receive the letter from Friar Lawrence, explaining the entire plan of faking Juliet's death, and this of course leads Romeo to taking fate into his own hands, and instrumentalizing both his and Juliet's death. Had the friar been truly cautious, he'd have taken the note to Romeo himself, or at least ensured he'd sent it via signed next day super first class recorded and tracked delivery. Instead he just gives it to some random monk, who ends up getting coronavirus and can't leave the house. In a way, this little error on behalf of the friar is what brings about the tragedy in the play that sees two teenagers perish. It goes without saying that love is at the forefront of Romeo and Juliet, and love becomes one of the main themes, if not the central theme. However, love is only portrayed in a very specific way between Romeo and Juliet, and that is the young, intense and often irrational love that is seen between teenagers. Not only does Shakespeare show us the highs of this experience, but also the crushing lows that the young and inexperienced may suffer should they wear their heart on their sleeves. The love between Romeo and Juliet is shown to be so intense that the two seem to lose themselves in each other, isolating themselves from the rest of the world in order to commit more time to each other. We see Romeo ghost his friends Benvolio and Mercutio so that he can profess his love for Juliet, and we see Juliet forsake the nurse, a woman who had been her companion for many years, all because she advised against seeing Romeo again. Both Romeo and Juliet are blinded by love, and cast away not only their obligations to their friends and families, but also their societal obligations, even shunning the long-standing hatred between their families, as literal brawls and skirmishes occur around them. To Romeo and Juliet, the world is at peace when they are together, even though it really isn't. Through this, Shakespeare characterises love as being a dangerous thing, in the fact that it can swoop people into this state of delusion that everything is okay, but then drop you just as suddenly into reality, where things are greyer than you could have ever imagined. Romeo and Juliet is a lot like modern relationships today, where everything is great and amazing in the beginning, but problems begin to sprout up, and where you once believed love would save you, you're soon to realise that this isn't the case. Shakespeare seeks to show us that love is not a constant thing, and that it is ever-changing, whether this be from the thrill of sneaking into each other's bedrooms like Romeo does with Juliet, or to the slump of missing the person when they are far away, as Juliet does when Romeo is sent to Mantua. Love is an ever-fluctuating thing, one that Shakespeare shows perfectly in Romeo and Juliet, in that sometimes, no matter how perfect it may seem, it could, and probably will, all end with you drinking poison. But before you go about sealing yourself up in a tomb, how about earning yourself some good karma and sparing a dollar for a humble creator? The Patreon donations help me fund the channel and to pay for the artwork as seen in the videos. I'm actually looking at getting some more animation done as well for future videos, so any donations would be greatly appreciated. In the meantime guys, thank you for watching and sticking with me on this one, assuming you're still there. If you are, then don't forget to give this one a thumbs up and don't forget to subscribe. As for everyone only watching the first two minutes, well, dare I say, a plague on all your houses. Nah, no, I'm just kidding. Just the ones with adblock.
拜。